Modern automobile has been trending in popularity recently, and many people are wondering if they should buy more, sell what they have, or stand on the side and wait for a better timing. As the market is still very volatile at the moment, we should be mindful of which stocks to pick and what is the exposure and the timing of our positions. Over the past few days, the price action of Molen has brought the stock around $2.66 before stabilizing around $1.89. The short-term trend for Molen has been bearish recently, and Molen is now in a retracement compared to the price increase during the earlier month of the year. The retracement is also synchronized with the market condition in general, so in this aspect, we should be mindful that it may not always have something to do with the stock's own fundamentals. When we look at the long-term trend of Molen, it's clearly been affected by the price trend of the tech stocks in general. Uh, the market has now reconsidered its needs and believes that the electric vehicle sector may be overbought, even when it's still relatively deflated compared to the high days of 2020. Apart from the existing issues with the supply chains, the capital is also looking to profit from the higher commodity prices, which will pull out the fund that would otherwise be able to benefit companies like Mullen. Now, let's also take a look at the technicals of the stock. The trading volume of Mullen Automobile has recently been 50 million shares, compared to the average volume of 128 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, its price fluctuated between $0.52 cents and $15.90. The market cap of Molen Automobile is currently at $452 million versus an enterprise value of $113 million. The difference between the market cap and the enterprise value is the premium or discount the financial market is willing to allocate to the company based on its current fundamentals, leverage, and asset composition. The enterprise value is the combined value of the company's assets minus the debts. If the company has a lot of debts or a negative image amongst market participants, the assets value is impaired. With that being said, at the end of the day, it remains an estimation of the market every time it publishes its financial statements, so it's less reactive than the market cap and often more lenient for many other companies. One key element to note regarding the enterprise value is that for many growth type companies, one of the most significant assets they own is the goodwill. Goodwill is an expectation of the market that a company is able to generate more profit or grow faster than the other ones, partially because it may be assumed to have a better management team, a stronger brand recognition, and a bigger online following. It is basically what is unique about a company in particular compared to alternative competitors. In other words, it's not a tangible asset that companies may use. It is, however, the reason why many companies are perceived to be trading on a discount, because the market cap is often lower than the enterprise value, especially in more volatile situations. If the company goes to liquidation, the good world would be completely depreciated, and we would be left with potentially less assets than whatever that is currently on the balance sheet. When we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 3% higher than the one-month low, 269% higher than the 12-week low, and 269% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which gives us a hint about the market sentiment on where the stock price is likely going to go next, the implied volatility is 204% versus a historical volatility of 221%. The put-call volume ratio is currently at 0.22. It is normal for many stocks to also tend to have a higher put option volume than what they deserve, because many institutional buyers would systematically hedge their positions. Most recent volume of options traded has been 20,000 contracts, versus the 30-day average of around 62,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 266,000 contracts versus a 30-day average of 395,000. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 0.54% of the current outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, BlackRock, and Renaissance. 
It's relevant to understand the shareholder composition of a company as this helps us to determine if we should hold the stock long term or to view it as a trade opportunity. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, this is a sign that the stocks may lack the depth to justify long term trust from shareholders. Typically, the consensus is that there should be at least 25 to 30 percent of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a short term trade. Obviously, a lot of exceptions would apply since there are many great companies mostly held by retail investors as well. But that tends to be the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes, when there are significant short interest in the total volume, this is a sign that there may be an organized shorting operation going on, like what is going on with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is 15% of the total float, and almost 50% of the transactions coming out of the dark pools. Usually, if the short interest is above 15% of the total volume, and a significant chunk of it coming out of the dark pools, this is a potential sign that the institutional positions have been taken to short the stock, and there would be potentials for a short squeeze. Overall, my recommendation based on the analysis is to make sure that you have a position in Molin, even if it's small, because it should be small enough so that your position balance won't be affected by this one single stock, and that you should be ready for the long haul. The market is volatile enough so that the weight should be worth it, and because the stock is at a historical low level if we look at the long term, I believe that the timing is still decent from a long term perspective. I would recommend to commit between 1 to 3% of your portfolio, and I would also recommend to split the allocation in batches of 20% at a time so that you may purchase more if it retraces. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option, and assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks, with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up, or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another, and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. 
The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, the degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When company announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.